All right, everybody, um, go ahead and grab your seats. Um, next up is JP O'Donnell. He is a DBA over at Cover My Meds and also had the misfortune of having to work with me. So, uh, JP, guys. Thanks. Actually, it wasn't that unfortunate working with Bill. He was nice. He was friendly. He has really good aim with a Nerf gun, just so you know. Oh. Sorry, that's better? Okay. Now it's in the way of me looking at my notes. Crap. Do that. That works. All right. So, uh, what is automation? Automation is anything you can do to make your life easier. Basically, don't do things manually. Automate them. That's what we're going to be talking about. Talking about how we automate our systems, the tools we use, what they did for us, problems we've run into, how we solve for them, and how about, oh, sorry, and how this helped make our lives easier, and what the benefits we've gained, and what, and what have we had to sacrifice to make that happen for us. All right, so when I first started at Cover My Meds, there was roughly three DBAs, 10 databases, and about 250 employees. And about last week, I did a quick check of the stats, and we're at um, sorry, over 3,000 databases. We're technically one DBA short, so we have six. And we have well, well over 100 um, developers. So I've to figure out how to scale for that, and I've only been there for four years. So it's a lot of growth really, really fast. Also, last week, Roughly, we did 3,800 deploys to production over the course of a year. So I took the stat last week from the previous year's week. All right, so we have massively grown. To do any stuff manually, this isn't going to work. We had to figure out a way to automate our, to automate our lives, otherwise we're going to go insane. All right, so real quick about me. I've been a, a DBA for roughly 10 years now, but I've had lots of hats in the IT world, everything from a developer, to a support person, to the FNG, and if you don't know what that acronym is, I'm sorry. Um, ask someone who's new and they'll tell you. Um, but a whole lot of different roles. So that's one reason why I've had a lot of insight into the different parts and roles inside the IT industry. Also, uh, DBA at Meds is a little different than your typical DBA because all the work we end up doing. We do more than just databases. We also do our systems, architectural design, building servers, various things. So with that in mind, what we do we keep our, all of our environments in sync. So people here who have to deal with testing environments, production environments, performance environments, integration environments, you all know that if you want to make sure your tests and your applications are working correctly, you have to make them the same all across the board. Otherwise, you can't validate what you're doing. You can't validate your tests. Because if it works in test, it should work in prob. But only if you have the same systems, the same schema, same base data, all that jazz. So that's one of the stuff we do. Um, we also have all of our own monitoring. And we don't just use the hand roll monitoring off the shelves. We sort of build it ourselves, okay? Help us out along the way so we know what we actually care about. I don't care about a transaction that's running for five minutes. I care about one that's running for more than 30 minutes against my master environment. If it's against my test, I don't care. Um, in addition to that, because of how fast we actually move at Cover Meds, we have a lot of environments being torn up and built all the time, or sorry, torn down and built up all the time. So we had to figure out a way to make that automated because building a database every couple of days from scratch is a pain in the ass. Raise your hand if you want to build a server every day from scratch. Not surprising. OK. So when we started to go about building these environments, to make our life easier, we wanted to find a template. OK. Why do you want a template? Does anyone, I'm assuming you all know what a snowflake is in the IT world. Raise your hand if you like snowflakes. Raise your hand if you want to do this to snowflakes. All right. Why are snowflakes bad? We all know why they're bad, but to go into it a little bit, we want our servers and our environments to be the same. We want to treat them like cattle, not like pets. Pets you love, you care for, you feed them. Cattle, when they piss you off, you shoot them in the head and build a new one. A little gross, but it works. All right? It doesn't allow for uniformity. It means that, you know, you go in there with your, with your servers. If they're all the same, you can apply one setting in one place, have it pushed out everywhere, and it works. You don't have to worry about, oh, right, there was that one Tuesday when you were sick and I did the work instead of you and I put the file in a slightly different place and changed the script, but it still works. So it's all good, right? Okay, how many of you run into that scenario where someone else built the server other than you and now you have to go figure out the magic they did to make it work because your way wasn't good, but their way's fine, right? Okay. So some examples of snowflakes we currently have or people have tried to get by us, so to speak, is like we have clusters, okay? So maybe some of our some of the servers in the cluster are like, oh, that one should be different because we're going to basically pin that one to run reports for our customers. But it's okay, you know, because it's still the same basic server, just a little bit extra beefier hardware, 
the NFS is differently mounted over here or whatnot. That doesn't work. So we sort of kill that earlier on. They go, oh, we just remember this really new cool feature in Postgres, in Postgres 11 that does this. But we're only on 10 in Proz. Can we put this one server at 11 so I can implement that change? It's no big deal, right? Do people here like having multiple versions of the same software at the same time in production? No one? Really? Okay. Shocking. All right. So with the templates, we're like, okay, one size fit all doesn't actually work, but you can try to at least template them to like, okay, for this particular application, one size will fit all, or this particular set of applications, you can sort of define them to be all the same way. You can't make every server in your whole environment be exactly the same. It's not gonna work. We all know that. We have different software, different versions, things that are needed. But you can at least cluster them together, say, okay, so my cluster for apps A and B are all identical, you know, with the exception of one being a master and the rest being a slave from a database point of view. For your applications, they may all be identical, okay? But don't try to make your whole environment identical. That won't work and it breaks down really, really fast. When you make these templates though, don't get too rigid. You have to think about what's gonna come next and you have no, no one has a crystal ball, but when you design it and you encode it, you can at least make it so it's easy to change. So when you make that template, don't just force stuff into it and go, hey, I'll just put this here and it'll be good because everyone needs that. If you do that, you're gonna end up finding that your server's gonna be way bogged down, have too many apps on them, too many options, too many configurations that aren't gonna work well, it's not gonna scale well, and you end up having to sort of use hard-coded values in places, you know, because you wanna put them there and you wanna make it work, but it's not working for you. So make a template, but make it loose to a certain extent. So I know those sound like opposite phrases, but if you make it too hard, it will not survive. So some of those templates you're gonna use though to help you build servers, all right? And so when you build a server, you have your template for it and you need to have your applications, you need to have your database, you have your IP, your IP configuration, um, all of your system stuff, your disk, number of cores, your memory, all that jazz, all right? When we would build these, we'd actually have a file that we basically would hard code values into, run it. It would be the same file applied to all six servers or nine servers or whatever in your cluster, so they're all identical. And we all have the same template file we pulled out of our repo and you just put in the value you needed for your individual system because you go, okay, this one's gonna handle um, a, a three million transaction a day throughput, so we need to have more cores, more memory. This one is more for offline reporting, so it can be a little bit slower, no big deal. And you all have the same template. But then you started to run into issues where people would all of a sudden modify the underlying template file to suit their needs. They go, oh cool, we're gonna have this one set up in this data center only, or that one in that data center only. And you all of a sudden have these problems around your base template file was no longer the same template. So we had to figure a way to fix for that. So we ended up using um, Jenkins. If you're, raise your hand if you're not familiar with Jenkins. Nice. All right, so real quick, those who aren't, Jenkins is basically, the way we use it is a nice automation tool to run scripts for us. You can embed a lot more into it, and we do for some cases, but for making servers, we basically have this little tool called Make VM. It makes a virtual machine for us. You literally just plug in a couple of values, and the template's the same no matter who you are, because that way, instead of having to run this manually in your shell, in your she, eh, sorry, instead of having to run this manually in a shell, you go to Jenkins, you open it up, you pop in the parameters you need, you run it, and your servers get built. All six of them. It knows automatically behind the scenes because it does it dynamically. Your different uh, data centers, uh, the different config options you have for your for your databases or your application servers, because it pulls it from a file that's managed, and it's managed in a central repo place. So you don't worry about it having on your own server or on your own local machine. You have it in one spot, everyone can use it. So it's just like version control. It'll assign the volumes to you, it'll install the database servers. Um, and then over time, we've actually evolved even more from it. It made it even better for us by taking that settings file that was in a shared repo and actually building it more into the job itself, making it more dynamic. So while we were talking about automation and making tools to make our lives easier, because you find a tool to do one thing great for you, we go, wait, what else can you do for us? We might as well spend the, we spend the money on you. What else can we get out of you? What else can we squeeze you for? So we also use to do automation of testing. So all of our lights on tests run through Jenkins. Um, removal of VMs runs through Jenkins. It's another job we do. So you just make, you make a new job to follow some script you give it, and it'll do it all for you. So we, did, we originally brought it in to help us make new application hosts or new database hosts, but then we realized we could leverage it for so much more. 
it's basically now become our automation tool, or one of them, I should say. So, but why do DBAs care about tests? All right, we can see that they run, and we want to see that they run and that they work and succeeded. Because I don't want to get a call from a developer or an application ops person to say, hey, this is screwed up. If I can see it myself from output of Jenkins or output of some other test, I then know to be able to work it out on my own. I can have Jenkins email me if the test had failed. I can have the test itself email me. I can have it page me, depending on what environment it's in, how much I care about it. It allowed me to sort of self-service my, self -service my own workflow to be able to go fix issues before someone else brought them to my attention. It made life, it made life better. So we still wanted more out of it. We had a way of creating servers, but now we wanted a way to manage the monitoring, do the alarming, the connection information, the cache settings, everything else, all right? Because we can make the servers, but then we still have to go on to each one of them and go configure the configuration settings. That sounded weird. Set the configuration settings, all right? And say, okay, this is this big. Here's how much memory cache you should use. Here's your user pool and all that other jazz. And we could do it. There are ways, but we wanted something that basically manage it for us. We could put it in one place and push it out. We didn't have to go in with Puppet. All right, Puppet for basically what we use it for is our server configuration management tool. All right, um, it uses Puppet, uses Hiera, uses YAML files, the whole shabam. It was really cool, really powerful. Not only do we use it to help manage our servers with the application settings and all the configurations, we also do it for user creation and permission settings. Configuration file management, uh, the different versions of the applications and of the processes running on them, our server settings. So instead of having to go out there and say, hey, this host now needs to have its max connections increased from 500 to 700 because of normal growth, we can change it in one spot and have it applied to all of our servers that meet that basic, um, sorry, have it apply to all the servers that are running that application code or running that uh, specific database. Go, hey, now instead of 500, you can now go to 700. It was really easy to do this, having to go out to all your prod servers and do it manually, put in one file, merge it, and it auto-deploys. So for us, we also have Puppet running in production nonstop every hour, randomly. It will deploy the changes to the whatever server it tells it to, based off of rules and stuff. So it makes any changing really easy. Also, you're guaranteed it changes everywhere. You know, it doesn't miss anything, because you have another, you can have Puppet output tell you which servers are or are not on the master branch of your, of your control, of your repo that has, that has all the files. There is dev time involved in figuring all this out and configuring it all, and coding it all up, making sure all work, and testing it. It's worth the time. If anyone has any issues arguing to their boss or whomever about spending developer time on configuring this type of stuff and figuring it all out, it's well worth it, because spending two days to do it up front versus a month of accumulated time while having to hand roll things and hand configure stuff, and also assuming you can do copy paste without making an error. Who, who here has ever copy pasted code and made an error? Be honest. All right, there you go. All right, this prevents that, okay? You put it in one spot and you, have a, and you can set up your repo, obviously, to do a peer review that everyone sees it. We also have hooks built into our Puppet repo in Git that uses Jenkins that will do an automatic um, pull down and say, hey, these are the settings you're changing. These are what the new settings are going to be. Is this what you really want? And it tells you what they are. So you go, oh, wait, I missed something there. Oh, my bad. This is not what I want. So it will tell you as you go. So we use automation on top of automation to make sure automation didn't break stuff. And I'll try another way to say automation four times. All right. So one of the things we wanted to get in there was monitoring. So we had some monitoring in place. We wanted to get more monitoring, though. And because all of our servers were already built through automation and we had them all scripted out, we were actually able to bring in a new monitoring system and push it out to all, to all 90 of our Postgres servers within about a week because we basically figured out the puppet code for it, um, did a couple of PRs to you know, validate what we were doing, push it to prod, and it all rolled out. There was not a whole lot of work behind it other than basically figuring out where to put it in puppet. There was no having to run it on this server, run that server, all that jazz. It was all automatically built up and deployed for us. It was really slick, real easy. It makes life a lot easier. All right. So another cool thing we've done with Puppet is our permissions. So within databases, obviously, you have connections, you have logins, users, all that jazz. We figured out how to, in our YAML, using Hiera, we actually have database configuration options for our applications. We have our individual user settings, our, sorry, individual user roles, logins, and passwords, 
and their default connectors for either their master or their slaves. It's all embedded in Hiera. And then our applications um, read from a local file on their application host that gets populated by a puppet run. So our control repo, which is what holds our Hiera, which is then read by puppet, um, puppet will run on every application host and say, hey, what application is installed here? It'll then reach back to its um, main source of info from its Git repo, uh, go ahead and build up its catalog, and apply it locally, and it'll populate the environment file that says, hey, for this application on this host, here's your envir settings, environment settings. Here's the database you can connect to. This is the connection string you're going to use it on. Here's your username, and here's your password. So nothing is, is stored in applications, and nothing's even stored with the database. It's all it lives in our puppet code and in our higher in our high era YAML files. It makes it incredibly easy to manage. You don't have any cases of you have mismatched passwords, mismatched usernames. It's all read from one local from one unified source that you know is always true and accurate because it's not copied anywhere. It gets put there by puppet, but you don't actually hand roll it yourself. You the puppet do all the magic for you. Um, I'm not sure how many people have dealt with like passwords getting out of alignment between one server and another because of different versions or when you upgrade um, user permissions or whatnot, but this does it all for you behind the scenes. We had to write the code to make it work in Puppet to go, hey, if your role is this type or this type of name, give it this type of permissions and whatnot. But once you do all that, then adding a new user or adding a new role is incredibly simple. In fact, I was actually able to change 17 applications connections to a database in a week. I said, hey, are you all going to get your own username now with your own roles? I had to do one PR per just to do it safely. And with, after a week, every single application that was connected to our database all had new usernames and new permissions and new roles assigned to it. And there were no issues. And this was across all three environments, so production, integration, and testing. And I think overall, it affected about 95 databases. Or sorry, 95 copies of the same database, so to speak, because we have the one in production and multiple copies of it. All right. So well now, and once you have all your username and password set up in there, if you want to go do a user rotation, because we all know that you're supposed to have this username and password changed out every so often for security. You don't want the same one all the time. It's having to go do that individually per application or whatnot. You can literally change um, a lookup value in your Hiera, in your YAML file, in one spot, and it will disseminate down to all your users. So we just have a simple rotation that basically uses the year and the quarter to, to distinguish which version of the username we're on. You do that, you change it in one spot, it applies to all 90 or so applications we have. Then the only thing you have to do is change the encrypted password because the password is also stored in, crypt, is stored, in, yeah, is stored in an encrypted string on YAML, so it's not plain text. You just have to basically automate that, but that's just using grep and set and aux, nothing hard there. You do all that and you can literally roll through all your applications, get them all new passwords, all new usernames overnight or in the middle of the day. Because if you are basically run Puppet first on your database servers to make sure the user's there, then the apps run it uh, locally on their host, Puppet does. And because of how we have it set up, our apps do not read in that, you, that new username to use until the app actually bounces, it brings it into memory. And so you can have the new one sitting out there, makes it on the database, then you can tell the, the apps to bounce whenever. It'll read it in, they're using the new creds, and you're done. So from my point of view, being a DBA, having done manual username changes, this is way simpler. I'd rather do this, you know, and be done in like a day than have it to spend it out over the course of three months. So the other thing we had to do was ETL. So ETL is extract, transform, and load. Um, so in our testing environments and integration environments, when our developers want to go test things or write things, they want to make sure that they have the same base data everywhere. All right. So you have some stuff that's your, um, in, our, in my industry, it's base data like your drugs, um, different uh, uh, payers or insurance companies, different plans, different forms that are utilized and whatnot. But you have all that data in prod, but you want the same base data across all your environments so you can test it, make sure that your code isn't going to break anything and whatnot. Having to move those data, that data around manually is painful and annoying as shit. Hopefully no one cares I curse. Um, it's really annoying. But basically, the deal is, to do this nicely, we decided, okay, you know what, we'll just do ETL. It'll pull it for us and push it for us. But then you're like, but I have to install ETL on all of my 80 test environments, and I got to write the job for all of them and whatnot. But if you go back to your automation where you built all your servers, 
you can now add a puppet fact to say, you know what, include your ETL tool on all of your database servers automatically. You do that with, with literally one PR against one file, you merge it, and now all of a sudden over the next hour, because how often Puppet runs, all your database servers have the ETL tool installed on it. Really simple, really fast, real easy. Because because in Puppet, it'll do it, recursive lookup for it to basically make sure all the dependencies are there for it and needed. Sorry, all the dependencies that are needed are there for it. It'll make sure they're all set up, make sure it works, and it's done. Then all you have to do is worry about the ETL jobs. And so you have your source and destination. Well, if when you're setting up your templates, if you pick a naming convention that makes sense for your industry, for your own place to work, but it's the same convention. So for where I work at, it's, uh, sorry, it's the data center it's in, the environment type, be it testing, integration, or production. Then the database, then the server type, if it's a database, it's going to be like DB or PG or database or Postgres. Then the environment it's in, the application environment, and then a number, number to denote which, you know, which one it is, if it's a part of a multi, multi, if it's part of a multi-server cluster. Because of that, we can simply look at a host name and go, oh, hey, you're a database host. And because of that also, we know that this database host talks to this database host or to this application host. So from that nice templated name that we gave out to all of our servers, we can then basically use um, wildcards in our ETL configuration to say, hey, this host is going to talk to this host, pull data from here, and push it to there. And it's all done through templates, and it's all done through wildcards. So we can go, hey, okay, testing server one, sorry, testing database server one, you're going to pull from testing master server and pull in the data. You know, testing master, you're going to pull from testing prod, or sorry, from prod, and pull in the data. So now you have your database across all your environments pulling the same data down from the same source without overwhelming that source because you're having to do all these one-off connections. You can just have it streamlined through a process. That you go, so in our situation, we went from production to integration to testing to one box each. Then each of those applications, each of those database servers in each of those environments, be it integration or, or testing, talk to their own master to pull out the data to its own environments. So we ended up having roughly in uh, testing 80 boxes and in integration 13 boxes, pulling data every hour or so to pull it out into its own local database to make sure all the data was set properly for our, our developers to do their testing and everything would work for them. Because you have your applications that expect certain data to be there because it is in prod, they want to make sure it's there in their environments. It worked really well. We ended up doing a little too much though. We ended up, um, our reason for doing it, like I said, was developers also, it helped the database people and the data teams know if a new change was coming in, if it would break any of their jobs that were running. Because the same ETL jobs you ran in testing and in other environments, we also ran in production to populate data into our analytics environment. So by putting them in our testing environments, we also tested their scripts for them. So they would make changes, get the, get the results from that, and if it errored out, it would basically email them. Problem was, though, it got a little too noisy. Because now, all of a sudden, a developer would make a change, it pushed out to all their testing environments, and it would break that same job 60 different places. So we had to scale it back a little bit, and we talked to our developers and said, hey, this was great when we only had like 10 or 15 environments and you didn't have it everywhere. Where do you actually need this now? So we found a better way to go about sort of using our template with our naming convention and say, okay, only these different systems need it. We're only going to put it on the masters or just on node one, not nodes one through seven or whatnot. But like I said, because we had our naming conventions and we had it all managed through Puppet and whatnot, it still made that change incredibly easy. Is that having to go manually to each host and say, don't run this here, or run it there, or comment out cron tabs? We could just do it in like a couple files and we were done. All right, so we talked about automation for the database, sorry, for the servers, the systems, the application connections, getting data around different environments. What about changes to the database? Okay, so your basic you know, schema changes or adding new data or whatnot. How do we do those? How do we make those automated? You know, who brings those changes to the DBAs? The developers do. That's part of my job. So it pains me, but the developers are my customers. So I have to be nice to my customers. Or in the previous person's lightning or um, Ignite talks that, you know, engineers be happy and be friendly. Should be happy and friendly to each other. They're not the enemy. We're not the enemy. We all we can be nice. Maybe. I'm getting skeptical of views. You think we can't be nice? All right. So anyway, working with the devs is part of our job. How was originally? We had one DBA. Um, it wasn't incredibly fast turnaround because they really wanted him. 
It took a while. Kind of a version control. It was literally copy and pasting code out of Git onto a command line to run it. Wasn't the best. Mass hysteria ensued. We needed a better process, but it had to be scalable. We had a way to do pull requests. And we wanted to use GitHub because that's what our developers already used. They understood that process. So we ended up coming with something to help manage all the aspects of the database. We wanted to keep it scalable, like I said. We had to, had to, we had to get it to grow with us, but not get too big or too crazy. It had to be able to handle DDL, so data definition language changes, DML, data manipulation languages, store procedures, functions, um, and also our basic initial designs or our seed or whatever you want to call it. So why do we want to do this, though? Do we want to do it because, you know, we wanted to make it better for us up front? Yes, it was more important to spend the time there and work with the developers to make our lives easier. We could talk to them now about what they're choosing to do versus having to scramble to build it, implement their changes. We wanted to, you know, avoid technical debt. We wanted to make sure that what we were doing would help make our lives better. We didn't want to do a percent of power. People think we did. It made us the gatekeepers, but that wasn't the intent. Um, it also allowed us to implement standards. Because instead of having to copy code around, we could then have the time to look back at it from a PR point of view and go, hey, what are we doing? Let's standardize this. We'll put in some checks and balances into our intake process. All right. It's evolved, like I said, our process has evolved over time. And it'll still be, it'll still, yeah, it'll still continue to evolve. This slide says seven DBAs. We actually are at six. Our new one isn't starting for another month. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that what we were doing allowed for us to do future changes and not make it more painful. And so this is the tool we end up using. It's DB Deployer, stainless plug. No one? No, the one person left. Thanks. Wow. OK, I'll work on delivery later. All right, so DB Deployer. It's a tool we use. It's built in-house by one of the DBAs. It's really slick. It's really easy. OK, how they recommend it. It allowed um, us to basically run that script, or right, run that tool, which is a shell script. It connects to Git. It pulls down information. It allows us to apply the change to the database in the right order every single time. It knows what it's missing. It'll apply it if it's not there. It'll warn you ahead of time what, it, what it's about to do. And it can operate um, on different branches as well. So it'll default to the master branch, but if you pull a different branch, it'll work off of that branch only. All right. So what did that solve for us? It allows us to then not just like keep track of what we're doing and not have to do copy-paste, I keep it in version control. It allow, also allows, because it's a shell script, Puppet can run that for us. So all those testing environments, integration environments I mentioned, if you test on one box, then one integration box, and then you push to production, you've only gotten three of your nodes up to date. You still have a whole mess left to do, like over 80. Do you want to go log in 80 times and do this? No. If you have Puppet configured for you, it can run it for you automatically and say, hey, you know what? I'm on the master branch. This is what I'm missing. I'll just apply it myself. It made life incredibly easy. We also allows us to be able to take advantage of GitHub hooks. So we could say, hey, you know what? If this is already approved by someone who has approval rights, then anyone can push the merge button. And then we can have a hook basically tell Puppet, you know what? Go run everywhere. So it doesn't even matter. I could even do a, an automatic deploy to production. As long as I give the approval and the, and the developer knows when they want to deploy it, they can deploy it whenever they want. I don't even need to be involved. I've already tested their code, made sure it works. They can push the button themselves. There's no reason why I have to, as long as you can trust your devs to not do dumb things, which we all can. So we still want to keep improving this. We still want to make our lives easier. So the solutions to be for now, sorry, solutions need to be for now and for the future. Um, we've learned over time that solving for a small problem doesn't work. You can start that way, but you have to think bigger as you keep going on. And don't do snowflakes. It's a really bad idea. All right. So what are we working on next? So backups. Any DBA will tell you backups are incredibly important. If you don't have backups, you're just wrong. You also need to test your backups. Just because you have one running doesn't mean it actually works. So we're trying to currently automate our backups restores. We currently do it for our monolithic database, which is 14 terabytes. It restores monthly to a testing environment, and we run tests to validate that a backup is good and it restores properly. We're still working on getting it set up for our other 90 plus databases out there. Okay, it's just figuring out the automation part behind it and making sure it works consistently. Um, we also want to make sure we keep our environments updated and patching 
Our patching is literally now push button, but we're still doing it manually. We're pushing the button manually. We're not running the script, as in not manually the command line. We're just pushing a button to do it for us. But we're almost there. Failover, same scenario. We actually did a failover last weekend where we followed scripts, we ran the scripts. Nothing was manual in the sense of no one was typing stuff. It was like, okay, run this script and then that script and hit basically enter and just find the right path. That was it. And the failover worked for us seamlessly. No issues. It was really, really great. Having done it the manually before, the amount of headache and issues and concern this solved for us was amazing. It's all because we started out with that simple idea of doing templates and not allowing snowflakes to get in there. And everything's the same or configured more or less the same and no one was special. It made our lives super easy. All right. So basically that's sort of the talk. That's a horrible way of end. Sorry. Um, the, uh, the first one is for DB Deployer. The second one is for all the stuff we do at Cover My Meds. So we have our own puppet stuff there if you ever want to get any of the stuff we do for Postgres or SQL Server or any of our puppet modules, bottoms and LinkedIn account. Last time I gave this talk, there were some questions. So I figured I'd leave some time at the end for questions. Any questions about anything? Or not? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. So if I understood the question correctly, I have a developer who wants to make a change to the database, adding new stuff, new primary keys, new columns and whatnot. How do I manage that risk events, what it might introduce to the already existing ecosystem? Yeah. Yep. 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 Gotcha. So also with the developer being the nagging pain in the butt, which is standard. Right. And it was probably the product person who was up here earlier, if I had to guess. All right. So the way we sort of approach that is we have a process in place. They give us the PR. Um, at the bare min, we say it has to go through a testing environment first before we can push it out anywhere else because we have to prove that it will work the way they want it to. Um, also, because of how we've embedded ourselves in the – sorry, how the business has asked us to, to embed ourselves in our system – is we actually sit with the developers. We sit in their teams. We go to their JIRAs. Sorry, we go to their sprint planning, to their retros, to all of their agile meetings, um, and we read from the board with them. But this does still happen. There are still times when someone's on vacation, their DBA is out, they ping you instead, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, basically, the way we deal with it, we basically approach them as a person and say, hey, what's the need? What's the risk? Let's go test it real fast. And yeah, I mean, I have gone from literally having a conversation at 9 in the morning to pushing it out into production by 1 p.m., you know, without any concern because we've gone through test environment, they ran their LOTs, their lights on test, their regression tests against it, nothing failed. Um, our other applications are constantly running all of their tests against it as well. And because I know that the code they put in is the same code I run everywhere because of all the tools I used, and I know all of our servers are set up the same no matter where I am with indexes and foreign keys and constraints and tables and everything, I know it's all the same everywhere because I can do a real quick check from that tool I mentioned, the DB Deployer one, it says, hey, you're on this branch. What is not deployed in your current setup but is on this branch? And if I get nothing back, then I know it matches. So I can go check out master and go do a quick report check and go, hey, am I up to date with master? So is everything in prod also here? I go, yes, cool. If I know that, then I now know if I, make, if I add their alterations or their changes, the impact it has there from a schema point of view is the exact same change that's going to happen in production. So if it breaks with a foreign key, then I know it's going to happen in production. It's going to break there. But if it passes, then I know I'm fine. Because it should be the same everywhere. Does that make sense? Cool. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, there, so every, any change that comes in, no matter who's asking for it, it has to follow the same process of you open a PR. And then we go through test. If you do integrate, it has to go through integration. If you don't, then so be it. Then we go to production. Um, but like I said, some of them are real quick, simple ones that we just start in the morning and push through prod. Others are like, okay, if we think this is going to be risky, maybe we'll go off hours because maybe we're going to change 2 million records. 
We had one the other day where someone literally changed 1.2 million users. It changed the property on, on a lot of their settings. And because we knew it was going to take some time to do that, because we have a testing environment that proved it to us, it says, oh, hey, this script ran for 45 seconds. We're going to wait to run it off hours in production so we don't block anything for that long. Um, so, yeah, for, no, matter what they're, no matter who's asking or what they're asking, we follow the same process to avoid any issues. It does create interesting conversations that can be slightly awkward when you go to your boss's boss and go, no, that's not going to happen. That's a horrible idea. Try again. But it happens. Other questions? Yes. So if I heard you right, you said when the automation applies it, how do I make sure it worked? And then how do I do rollbacks? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So um, the way the tool is written, actually, um, it'll apply the change. If any part of that change fails, it's all wrapped inside a single transaction. So it automatically rolls back for us. Also part of our process, when a developer submits any type of change to us, they have to submit along with it a rollback script. If they don't, we will help them write it if they don't know how to. We have documentation to say, hey, if you're doing insert, use this. Update, do that. Delete, do that. You know, all our different settings, or sorry, all different options. But we make sure every change has an equivalent rollback script to go with it, so we can roll back if we have to. The way we validate, um, literally, is we rely, we, we rely on our tool because it does a quick check against master of, hey, is anything here that's not in master and everything in master here, so to speak. So that, that's how we do our validation. Um, also, our developers are pretty good at making sure, hey, you said you deployed this, but I don't see the new column, or no, the data hasn't been changed, or whatnot. But yes, yeah, so we have some we have um, automated checks in place from our tools, and we have just the human eye check from the developers and from the DBAs themselves. So, cool? Cool. Another question? Yes. So DB Deployer, um, Flywheel I'm not overly familiar with. Um, I know um, uh, there's someone that, I can't remember what it's called right now. It has to do with ICE, I think. It's not Cold Fusion, but that's not the right, the right tech. What? That'd be it. How'd you get there from ICE? I mean, that's the right one, but how'd you get, okay. Anyway, yes, Liquid Base. Um, that's just creepy. Um, Liquid Base, my understanding behind that one, it has a um, version control on it. Um, and it sort of does this, it sort of does self um, self per, I think it does a per table I believe liquid base memory serves it says this table is at this version this table is at that version and how it manages it the way DB Deployer works is there's one database per server and it basically logs all the changes to that dat to all the databases in that server on a um, per database level and it marries it up to the checksum in, in the Git PR and the file name that it applied and all our file names have to, the way we do it in order, our file names have to meet a standard of template, which is basically year, month, day. So that way we know we apply them in order. So that makes sense for answering your question at least? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, so the question was around when you rotate users and make new ones, do you ever get any issues with that? Um, the only, because of how our system is set up, Puppet, in our way, where we defined it, only adds new. It does not destroy old. So, yeah. No. Well, we do. It is existing ones. Um, so we can do it one of two ways. One, um, we can either ex rotate existing ones, and because of how our system is set up, the applications utilizing them will not read in the new stuff until the application is bounced. Um, and also with most databases, once you log in, you're logged in. Um, and then if it's a case where we're switching out the user and the password, then it basically we have two at once that both exist and are both valid. And we basically go going behind after that and killing the old one. Am I out of time? No, you're fine. All right. You still have five, all right, cool. I just to make sure I'm getting oh. back to my job. All right, cool. We had a organizer transition. Aha. Damn it, Bill. All right, does that answer your question now? Cool. Any other? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh. Okay. 
So it sounds like everything we're talking about is mostly relational database related. Um, what about NoSQL? Have you guys proofed out anything with the tool uh, for non-relational databases? Um, we haven't used it for non-relational, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work. So the only difference between my knowledge of non-relational and relational is literally constraints and foreign keys. So those, I mean, you can make a database that has no foreign keys and this would all still work just fine and dandy. Um, literally what this does is it literally pulls down from Git and says, hey, here are the files in this branch, okay, whether it's master or branch, and then it compares it to the list of files that are saved off in the, da in the table that this tool utilizes. So there's no relation there at all. So there's no, there's no need for uh, reliance on relations for foreign keys. So literally goes, hey, what have I applied? What do I still need to apply? It does a diff. And the diff actually happens inside a shell script. So this, this, will work just, this will work for that just as well. The only caveat to that is I don't know if the language um, that it assumes that not the NoSQL would take in to create the tables as it needs to would still work. Because um, I mean, it, it right now it works for MySQL, Postgres, and SQL Server, or MSQL. We've, we've tested and proven those um, because it uses just basic T-SQL to create the database it needs and create, sorry, not to create the database, to create the tables it needs in the database. The database is actually created by Puppet. And then this tool will come in and say, hey, is my table here? Oh, it's not. I'll make my table real fast so I can do the DDL. And then I'll start inserting records into it. If you try to do the NoSQL, I, I know some NoSQL will take T-SQL and some won't. So it depends. Um, you might need to put a wrapper on that to make it work. Um, the only other caveat is that this tool assumes you're doing SQL or SQL. So it only, it only does the check for files if they're there or not based off the extension, and so the extension has to be .sql, but even though it's .sql, you could have it do whatever you want. It could be a shell script that just ran random crap. It's just gonna be automatically wrapped in a transaction because how, how this does it, but it's um, able to be easily changed because it literally does it utilizing a before and after, um, uh, before and after shell script that gets run with it. So in the very first shell script, the one that says begin tran, and the last one that says commit tran but those can easily be removed or replaced with something else. So this should be able to work for NoSQL as long as you might have to change some of the code or some of the language in it and say, hey, instead of using SQL to build your table, do this. Or you could have your managing database be a SQL, sorry, be a T-SQL type database and still apply the changes to a NoSQL environment. So that would still work. Other questions? I think we can do one more. Say again, please. Does the does support, support DB2? DB2. Um, it should, I think, as long as as long as you can connect to DB2 through shell through a you know, through a command prompt, it should work fine. You might need the drivers there for it, but yeah, it should. Cool. Well, thank you. Let's give them uh, another round of applause.